website accessibility and the challenge for today was to think about what we could do to accommodate um, different sorts of disabilities. And as we're doing this, one of the things that we're going to review is the things that we are doing to accommodate people with disabilities. How do they have an impact on people that don't have those particular disabilities? My guess is, is that we'll find that one of two things. Either they'll be helpful, at least some of the time, for people that don't have disabilities, or they won't really have much of an impact at all. So it definitely won't hurt people that don't have disabilities, um, some of the accommodations we're going to make for people that do have disabilities. So I'm going to put up a list of what we had last time of different disabilities that might have an impact on how people access the web. Let's see, there were things like, looking for a sheet of paper here. Let me pull one from here. There were things like visual impairment. And that can ra run the range of blindness, poor vision, or blindness. Another one we mentioned was hearing. And then again, it could either be full deafness or just poor hearing. We talked about control issues. And that is a variety of physiological or neurological issues that can affect the ability of things such as being able to type at a keyboard, uh, being able to um, navigate a mouse. And I mean that can include things such as paralysis or neurological diseases such as Parkinson's. And I guess we could even include things like um, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, or arthritis in those. Those can affect someone's ability to, um, to, to, to navigate um, the web. We talked about different cognitive disabilities and issues. That would be things such as ADHD, dyslexia, and so on where people have, for whatever reason, impairments to their understanding content. Um, are we missing anything else from here? The one thing that we said was age-related conditions, which in a way is a little bit of everything, possibly. As people get older, they may not be blind, but their vision tends to get worse. They may not be deaf, but their hearing tends to get worse. They may not have full-blown um, you know, carpal tunnel or, or things such as that, but with arthritis that everyone inevitably gets, it, it might be difficult to, or, or harder at least, to navigate the mouse. And finally, uh, they may not have full-blown um, issues w uh, in the area of cognitive, but people's memories tend to be not quite as good. All right. I think this is a pretty good list. If there's anything we forgot, maybe it'll pop into our minds and we can add it. All right. Let's go through and let's consider some of the things that we can do to help people with this, these different impairments. As we do, we're going to find out, we're going to find two common themes emerge as we look at some of the accommodations that we can do for people with these different disabilities. One is clarity or simplicity is maybe another way to put it. And the other thing is multiple presentations. That is taking the same stuff and presenting it two different ways. 
Now, in a way, this might seem contradictory. All right? It may seem contradictory to say we want to keep it clear, uh, simple and clear, but we want to also show the same thing multiple different ways. Isn't that sort of the opposite of simplicity? Wouldn't simplicity be to just show it one way? Well, it's interesting. Um, simplicity is, is focused on, but again, you don't want to simplify things to the point of, as they would say, dumbing down the content. You want to keep the content on the page and the presentation of the page appropriate for the subject that you're talking and appropriate for the audience that you're talking uh, to. It's almost as though simplicity and complexity sort of go hand in hand. There's a great quote by Albert Einstein who said something to the effect of things should be made as simple as possible but no simpler. All right? And what they're saying is you got to strike a sweet spot between making something simple and making it complicated. Complicated is good because there's a lot of information in there. If you, if you write a page with tons of content in it and tons of diagrams and all that, you can possibly convey a lot of information. The downside of that, though, is that you may distract people and you may get people lost in, in the, the sea of information. If you make things simple, it'll be easier to make an impact for someone. If you just have a few words on a page, people are going to notice those few words as opposed to having paragraphs and paragraphs and, 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 and animations and videos and audio clips and so on. But you run the risk of not giving them enough information. So for every project that you're working on, you want to consider your audience, consider your user goals, and you want to consider um, the, the subject matter and present in a way that is of appropriate simplicity and or complexity. All right, find that sweet spot. Now that being said, if you look at bad websites, most bad websites make the mistake of trying to be too complicated instead of trying to be too simple. It's like, yes, there are people in the world that exercise too much. However, most people don't exercise too much. So the advice hey, get plenty of exercise is probably good advice for most of the people in the world, right? There's a small, very small percentage of people that might exercise to excess, but those people are pretty rare. Same thing with web developers, right? Web developers, the tendency is, I've learned how to do all these great things. I've learned how to put videos and other content on my page, and I can change colors, and I can change fonts. And the tendency, especially when you start web developing, is to say, well, let me do all these things all at once. All right? And that ends up with a very cluttered, complex web page. And if you notice, think back to the web pages that you described um, for the assignment where you had to put something that was a good website and a bad website. Most of the bad websites were, if I was going to describe them, with a few words, I'd say too complicated, too involved. Can anyone remember what they picked for their bad website? Susan Collins? Susan Collins? And who is Susan Collins? Uh, the author of oh, okay. She, I say she's also a senator. <laughs> Suzanne Collins, okay. There we go. All right. Here's an example of a page one of the students picked as a bad page. And what don't we like about this? As we scroll for another half hour or so. Well, there's a few things I would observe. Um, for lack of a better word, it looks kind of half-baked. It doesn't look like someone finished everything. It looks like sort of a prototype. I mean, the navigation is clear enough, but it could probably stand out a little bit more, be maybe a little bigger. Um, it seems like things were sort of plopped on the page as opposed to, you know, arranged. Uh, but probably the worst thing about this page is that there's just, she just throws 
and I'm saying she, she may not have been, you know, she probably didn't actually develop it, but had someone develop it for. If you look, there's just review out of review out of review and all that. There's just way too much content. This is way too complicated involved of a page. It would be better to simplify things and, um, you know, organize things a little bit better. Anyone else want to volunteer a bad website? that they have thought. That's, that's a good example of a bad one. That's a little bit different. I mean, this one, this one there, there are definitely problems with it, and I would call it a, a, a poorly designed site. But some people have found some pretty over-the-top bad websites. I wish I could remember some of them. Well, let's Google it. Here we go. Here's what we're talking. We have assembled more than 6,000 wow. images of Wisconsin Wow, and Dollars he just jumps in your face and starts talking to you, the little guy down here. Again, is this too complicated or is this too simple? Email to find out what your bottle is worth. If you need a bottle cleaned, <laughs> this guy just isn't shutting up. Is cleaning, and it's available. That blue bottle in the bathtub. This I would describe as definitely to too complicated. The background is very one, busy. Or this it's one. hard to read really, stuff. Just There's way Wisconsin too much content. The navigation is Enjoy. sort of obscured. Stay glassy. I can't even watch that. Pardon me. Yeah, I, was, I can't even watch that one anymore. Um. Oh, here's an interesting thing. It looks like they changed the site. Maybe they realized that their site was on a list of poorly designed websites and they improved it a little bit. Oh, here we go. I mean, my head hurts looking at this. I, I really, I, I don't even know where to begin if I was looking for something. There seems to be no organization. There just seems to be sort of the notion of if a little bit of content is good, then a lot of content is going to be great. All right? And as we know, that's not necessarily the case. So, my point to all this is that, yeah, you want to make, you want to cross a balance between having something too simple and having it too complicated. But keep in mind, the error that most web developers make is make things too complicated. So, yeah, it's possible you might be that one in a million person that um, designs things too simply. But, again, more than likely, um, you're going to be, you're, you know, you're, you're the natural tendency of people to develop web pages is to make them too complicated. The fashion designer, uh, Coco Chanel, said, uh, her, uh, her advice to a woman going out for a, a uh, you know, to a cocktail party or some fancy event was to look at yourself in the mirror and take off one accessory before you go. All right. Her idea again was the idea that less is more. You know, if you have a beautiful pair of earrings on and a beautiful necklace and beautiful rings and a beautiful brooch and all these things, they're going to be fighting for attention. And you're not going to really, uh, the people looking at you aren't going to really notice it. And each individual thing is going to have less impact. Whereas, if you, if you simply wear a handful of accessories, her advice was, um, then, then the ones that you wear will make a big impact because people will notice those. And I know I'm probably the last person on earth that you'd want to take fashion advice from. But... All right, I do think it's relevant as far as web design goes. Look at your page and say, is there something that we can take out or make simpler or, or whatever? All right, so simplicity is one of the keys to making your website accessible. The second thing that's a key is the notion of multiple presentations. And multiple presentations simply means displaying the same content a couple different ways. 
Why do you think that's a good idea to display the same content a couple different ways? Right, number one, it could be boring if you are simply showing the same stuff the same way, page upon page upon page upon page. I attempt to do that in the lectures by sometimes showing the writing, sometimes showing an example on the computer screen, sometimes simply talking and, and, and looking at you, especially again when I'm, I'm talking about the video. Here you can see all those things at the same time, but when I record the video, um, I try to give a little bit of variance for that. What's another reason why presenting the same content in the same way might be uh, in different ways rather, might be beneficial? Well, what if your disability makes it difficult to access it one way or another? In other words, a, a person that's blind or visually impaired will have a hard time seeing a photograph or maybe not able to see a photograph at all. That's where you put in alternate text to describe the image to someone. Again, it's not as good, it's not a replacement for viewing the image, but if someone can't see it at all, at least that helps them somewhat. Another example that we talked about last time is with audio recording. All right. Um, if you have an audio recording on your page, maybe you also want to include a transcript of that or a written version of it. That way, if someone can't hear the audio recording, at the very least they can read the transcript and they can get the information that way. All right. It's important for those reasons at all. Also, I'm sure many of you have heard, um, and, and maybe, maybe you've even thought about this for yourself, that different people have different learning styles. All right. They, there are people that are called visual learners. In other words, don't tell me how to do something, show me how to do something. Right? Show me, you know, if you're learning how to knit, for example, you know, um, don't have a list of things, you know, do this, do this, do this, written steps. That may work for some people, but for other people, they actually need to see it. They need to see a video for it. All right? And it works that way for a, for a number of things. For most people, the more senses that you engage, the better it is to remember. All right. So, if you, you know, you think of a kid learning to read, if you show a picture of a dog and have the letters for the word dog and say the word dog, you're showing that a couple different ways and you're involving several different sentences. If you even take it further and have a stuffed animal that's a dog and hand it to the kid, then you're engaging touch too. Uh, in, in, in mathematics, when kids are just learning mathematics, a lot of times they'll give them pennies or little blocks or whatever and say, all right, I have five pennies, I take away two, what do I have left over? You know, and they can actually, they can hear the words, they can actually touch and push to the side the pennies and that's a good way to learn because they're, they're not just hearing it or thinking about it, they're actually seeing the, the, the pennies and they're actually touching the pennies. It's getting more and more and more senses involved in that. And it's the same way with websites. You have people with different learning styles, you have people with different abilities and disabilities where it is more difficult to view the content one way or another. All right? And for most people, the more senses you involve, the better they're going to be. So you're going to present the stuff same diff you know, several different ways. You know, a video and a um, uh, uh, and text. An audio clip and text. A picture and text. Um, text and a diagram. You know, you can say this all different sorts of ways. All right? Um, and then it gets into things like use the colors. That's another form of multiple presentation because some people can see certain colors better than other, other colors. Now, in a way, again, these things sort of conflict. And one end, I'm saying to be very clear and, and simple. In another respect, I'm saying, well, show them the same content a couple different ways. That's not a contradiction. It's a balance that has to be struck. All right. Your job as a designer is to find where on that sort of continuum between very simple and bare bones 
and very involved and complicated you want to get into. For example, that horrible website, and I'd bring it back up, but we wouldn't be able to get the guy to shut up again. Um, that, he was involving multiple senses, right? He was involving you know, us hearing. He was showing us stuff. In fact, he showed us a lot of stuff. What was the problem there? That was clearly a case of overkill. All right? At a certain point, multiple presentations, if it's too in the face and it's too excessive, becomes uh, a case of, of you, know, you don't know what to focus on. And there's just too much going on. So you want to strike a balance between those two things. Now, let's look at these different visual, imp uh, visual impairments, hearing, and other disabilities. And let's see what we can do. And let's see how it fits into clarity and multiple presentations. Someone with visual impairment, what are some things we can do to help them? All right. Make sure that the font is readable. Make sure the font is simple and clear. All right. Again, a case of simplicity. Instead of using a fancy involved font that it may be easy to uh, obscure the letters or, or, uh, or confuse the letters, use a very clear font that is very easy to read. That will help people to have poor vision. Make sure it's of an appropriate size. Possibly make sure that the person can choose the font and theme of their page. That way they can customize it even further. All right. Both of these are cases of simplicity as far as making sure the font is readable and so on. And also of um, multiple presentations, allowing them to choose between um, that. Making sure that there's a good contrast between the, the text and the font or the, the text in the background is another example. Many of those put image, uh, many of those bad sites that we looked at like had text on top of images. Again, far too involved, far too complicated and it, it simply um, obscured the text and made it difficult to read. All right. Um, showing pictures of things along with um, showing words. All right. So if someone can't see the picture or isn't sure what's going on in the picture, they can always read the words. Or, in the case of someone that's totally blind, have the screen reader wor read the words to them. Color blindness. Make sure that color isn't the only way that you differentiate between two things. For example, if you have text on your page that is important, and you want to make sure people read it. It's okay to put it in red, but keep in mind that some people aren't going to notice it if it's in red because if they have certain kinds of color blindness, they can't read red. All right? They can distinguish red from other colors. So what you might do is make it red and bold, red and underlined, red and in italics, red and bigger, red and smaller, Anything that you can do to give a different visual cue of that this is somehow different and draw attention to it. Put a border around the text. That sort of sets it apart from the rest of the text and might allow a person to focus on that. So we've learned how to do all these things in CSS. All right? We've learned technically how to put a border on something and how to change the colors and so on. Your job as a designer is then to take the things that we've learned and apply them to a particular problem and apply them in a way that is going to make it easier for people to get the stuff on your page, to understand. The colors and borders and everything you're going to use aren't just there to make it look good. Yeah, we do want it to make look good, but it's there to be sort of a nonverbal guide to your page, what's important about your page, what's different about the page, how your page is organized. You know, it, it is standard in a newspaper, for example, that the bigger something is, the bigger a headline is, the more important it is. 
That's a visual language, right? It doesn't matter what country in the world we're in, I wouldn't think. I would think every country in the world, if we were to look at their newspaper, the most important headline is going to be the biggest one. All right? Um, kids, when they're little, when they draw things, they draw things uh, not necessarily exactly how they see them, but how they interpret them in their mind. So if something's important, they'll draw it real big. Right? If they love their cat, their cat will will tower over their house when they draw a picture of that, oftentimes. It's funny, too, to look at kids' drawings of their family, and even though the kid's three years old, he'll be as big as uh, his uh, eight-year-old brother or something, because, again, obviously to them, themselves are pretty something that's pretty important. All right? So, your job as a designer is to look at these visual things that you can do and figure out how you can do it to better communicate your material. And in your doing it, you, in doing this, you, you keep in mind the notions of simplicity, multiple presentation, and try to accommodate people across the spectrum of abilities and disabilities. Now, as far as people that don't have these disabilities, is anyone going to complain if the font is too easy to read? Probably not. Is anyone going to complain if there's good contrast between the foreground and background? No, I don't think so. Is anyone going to complain if you give them a choice uh, between different fonts or different color schemes? Probably not, provided that it's not too complicated to do it. Right? If it's something you can just click on and easily do it, that's okay. The only way people would complain about that is, again, if it got to be too complicated. If it wasn't very clear on how you do it and you end up you know, causing yourself trouble. All right. Is anyone going to complain that the warnings are not just in red, but they're in italics as well? Of course not. Hearing, as far as simplicity and multiple presentation. We talked about some of these things already. Having a transcript for something, uh, for, for audio, for example. Um, having captions on video. Now again, a caption on a video, let's, let's think of different people that might access that. Someone that has perfect vision and perfect hearing, a caption on a video, yeah, probably won't bother them too much. All right. A person that can see and not hear can see the captions and read it and see the video and read it. A person, a person that can hear but not see can at least hear the, um, hear the, 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 the audio of that. I have heard, um, and I don't know if it's a setting on my TV or on my cable that I accidentally turned on or what, but <laughs> once I had it where there was someone describing what was going on on screen, um, not in words. For example, it would say, John walked into the kitchen. And then John starts talking. And then John, you know, um, is looking through his briefcase for his cell phone. You know, the things that, like, you could see but weren't expressed in words, there was a description of that. And that would be another option for that. Now, maybe someone that isn't deaf sometimes doesn't hear words right. You know, I mean, I, you know, me being a little bit older, a little bit harder hearing, every now and then when I hear something on TV, it's like, what was that? Well, captions could help me, right? I could turn on the captions. Or someone is in a hurry for something, right, and doesn't want to sit through the whole video, could read a transcript of it, all right? So again, as long as you don't slide into overkill and damage the clarity of the site and, and, and damage the simplicity of the site, then multiple presentations will not affect people that don't particularly suffer from the disability and in some cases it could help even them. Motor controls. All right. What are some things we can do for someone that has carpal tunnel, let's say, or has problems with their hands shaking and can't move a mouse very well? Any thoughts? What can we do on a website? Yeah, well, this one's a little tougher, right? 
Well, we can make the things that they click on big enough. All right, so it's clear. In other words, instead of clicking on a very small area of the screen, you can have a bigger navigation, make a very obvious, clear, and big navigation. All right. Another thing you can do is you can provide keyboard shortcuts. For some people, it's easier to interact with a keyboard than interact with a mouse. So if you can provide keyboard shortcuts to navigate through a site, that can also um, benefit uh, people as well. Now, here's an interesting thing, you know. Where, where, what's another context in which having a big area to click on is, is desirable? Not the person having a disability, but on a different sort of device, on a mobile device. All right? On a mobile device, you want your links to be sufficiently sized so that if someone goes to press the link, they don't end up hitting six links at the same time. You know, they, they end up hitting the one that they want. So some of these things go together. For people with cognitive disabilities, again, dyslexia, ADHD. For ADHD, one of the things you want to do is you want to remove any extra stuff that serves the potential of distracting people. And you don't really see this too much anymore, but in the old days, uh, a lot of people would put things like animations on their page of just like a, you know, I don't know, a, a flaming logo is always a joke. They, they, you have your logo that was on fire and it would be flaming or an animation of, you know, a, a cat running around in circles or whatever, all right? The thing is, is again, people with ADHD are especially prone to having that distract them and, and throw them. But even people that don't suffer from that are liable to potentially um, be distracted, um, have that distract their attention from the stuff that is important and the stuff that they're finding, uh, that, they're, that they're actually on the page and trying to find. Again, remember, everything on your page has a potential of taking people away from the other stuff on the page. What does that mean? That means don't put anything on your page that's not necessary. All right? And again, that doesn't mean that your page has to be boring or whatever, but have a reason, have a purpose for everything you put on your page. All right? Yes, an image can make a page more attractive, and it can give the user an idea of what your site's about, and it can serve a purpose. But images that show a top spinning or just, you know, some goofy animation generally don't um, provide... Um, any, any extra value and simply make it distracting and take away bandwidth for that. All right. People with cognitive disabilities, ADHD, um, dyslexia, will also benefit from a clear font. They'll also benefit from having possibly an, in, uh, an image along with the text because the image sort of puts that in perspective. All right, they take a look at the image, and the image along with the text can sort of help the person understand what the content is about. One that I did not mention, um, that it doesn't really fall in the cognitive, but it falls in the neurological, um, is epilepsy. And with epilepsy, certain animations that flash can trigger seizures. So you want to be very careful about that. All right. Um, and, and don't do it if it's not essential. If, if you ha now, that doesn't mean never use an animation. Sometimes an animation can be very effective. If this was a geology class, let's say, maybe I want to show how a volcano erupts, and I have a nice little animation that shows this and that happening, however a volcano erupts, but the process that, that it goes through. So yeah, if it benefits, Explaining to people how something happens, include it. But you might want to include an alternative. And for example, a set of still pictures that would not be an animation that would not um, set off someone that had, uh, or potentially set off someone that had epilepsy. Any questions about this stuff? And again, age-related conditions is sort of a little bit of all of the above. In a way, this is just confirming a lot of what we talked about when we talked about basic good web design and when you did some investigation of it. That's why 
the notion of good design is often called universal design. It's not so much developing for people with disabilities, but developing to make everyone's life easier. And that includes people with disabilities. The next topic that I want to talk about, I want to introduce today, and we'll, we'll finish it up on Wednesday. But that's a topic of forms. All right? And I want to talk about a little more complex or involved sites in the stuff we've been doing. So we've had over a half semester of HTML and CSS. Yet with the stuff that we've done so far, we can explain, and not even, not even explain it and, and duplicate, duplicate it, but we can't even see how a site like Google works, right? Because a site like Google is very different than anything we've had before. How is a site like Google different? Well, the pages that we've been looking at so far are what are called static pages. In other words, you look at the page today, you look at the page tomorrow, it's going to be the same page. A site such as Google, however, varies. And it varies depending on what? It varies depending on a number of things. Here we are on Google, and again, if I went to Google on another device, um, it might look very similar to this. But if I go and type in, um, let's say, what do I want to type in? Day of the Dead. All right. Notice what I get. I get stuff related to that. All right. Now let's think about this and analyze this a little more detail. Does that mean that Google has a web page for every possible thing I could possibly think of Googling? No, it doesn't sound very realistic, right? And if we look at this, and if we notice, there's stuff that are on the page, uh, that's on the page this year that probably won't be there next year. For example, Prince Charles in Mexico on Day of the Dead. That was 15 hours ago, all right? Mexico City, Day of the Dead celebration, and specific to November 2nd, 2014. All right, next year they'll probably have other news articles about the celebrations that happened that year. All right. Let's Google something else. Let's Google Italian restaurants. And here's interesting because I guess when we look at the results, we got to think of there being one of two possibilities. Do we notice these Italian restaurants, the top ones Google rated, do we notice anything funny about those? Anything unusual? Yeah, they're all in the Illyria area. All right? Well, what's so funny then? What's so funny? What's so unusual about that? Well, one of two things has to happen. All right. Either all the best Italian restaurants in the world are located in the Elyria, Ohio area. That's one possibility, right? Or, probably the second more realistic possibility, is that somehow Google knows at least approximately where we are and is therefore gearing their search results to our specific location and so on. Pardon me? Kind of creepy, yeah, it is. Uh, wait till you do things on mobile devices and can tell you like exactly where you are in like in mobile web development. We do a, a thing in the class, uh, in our my mobile web development class where we have, where we create a campus map. And when you view it on a mobile device, there's a dot on there that shows here is where you are, you know, and, and that, that's kind of, that's kind of weird. Yeah, it is. 
You can, yeah, you can see whose uh, car was in the driveway the, the day that the, 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 the Google folks took their picture and so on. Yeah, it is, it is kind of weird. All right. So this is obviously different than what we've done as far as web pages. It's different because every time we go to Google and do a search, we get different results. We get results that are, number one, specific to what we typed into that box. In other words, I typed in Italian restaurants, I got stuff about Italian restaurants. I didn't get stuff just about like restaurants in general or Italian stuff in general. I got my exact search results geared toward that. You may not think that's a big deal, but if you think about it, with plain old HTML you can do that, right? Plain HTML creates what are called static pages. Static pages are pages that look a certain way, and they look that way until you manually go in and change it. The pages that Google produces are called dynamic pages. Dynamic pages are pages that are generated for users based on the request. And it can take into account a number of different things. In this case, it took into account what we typed into the search box. It didn't show us Polish restaurants, it showed us Italian restaurants. All right. It can also take into account current events. When we searched Day of the Dead, we didn't see stuff that happened in 2011 or 2012. We saw news articles from yesterday. So it took into account current events. All right. Finally, again with Italian restaurants, it took into account our location, at least our approximate location. It knew that we were in the Illyria, Ohio area. And therefore, it, uh, it geared its results based on that. So I'm going to draw a diagram that I probably have drawn in class before. And if you take more web development classes, you'll see this diagram a million times. All right? And that is the way that the client, who is the person browsing the web, either on a desktop machine, a laptop, a tablet, a mobile or other mobile device, interacts with the web server. Remember, the web server is where the web pages live, all right? And when you make a request, here you are. You make a request to the internet, which again, we show as a class, because we're not interested on what goes on inside of there. Don Huffman is interested in what goes in, on inside of there. Some to the internet makes it to the appropriate web server and the web responds to the client with the web page. And it sends back HTML, CSS, and maybe some other stuff. Now, in the case of the static pages that we have, the web server does a very simple thing. It simply finds the page the person asked for and sends that page down the line. That's a basic static web page. Server's job is very easy. They simply find the page and send it down the line. For dynamic pages, the job becomes harder because the server doesn't have a completed web page. There's not a completed web page sitting out on Google server somewhere for Italian restaurants in Illyria, all right, or Day of the Dead stories for November 2nd, 2014. Instead, there's a set of instructions for creating pages like that by accessing databases and running programs and doing that sort of stuff. And the web server can take the user input, that is what I typed in the box, it can take information about current events, it can take information about the location, it can take information about the platform you're running. For example, if I go to a page to download a particular piece of software,
let's see if this one holds true or not. There's a free download. I click on it. And it may not be obvious, but it downloaded the Windows version of Firefox. Did I ever say that I was on a Windows browser? No. But part of my request that I made to the server contained not just the page that I wanted, but information about me as a client. Like approximately where I'm located based on my IP address. The IP address the, the, uh, um, a server can use to kind of figure out approximately where you're located. It contains information about what platform I'm running, Windows or Mac, and, and so on. Now, our topic in this class is going to be forms. What are forms? Forms are what we saw on Google, where we go into Google, and we can Google something. Let's look up Polish restaurants. And again, they're in the Cleveland area. If we look, where do I want to look here? Advanced search, we see a better example of a form. Forms in HTML allow the user to enter data that's going to be sent to the server. All right? So in other words, if I do a search, I might only want pages that are in English. I may only want pages in the United States. I may only want pages that have been updated within the past month. And so on down the line. I can put all these parameters in. When I click this button, those values get sent to the server, and the server can then go do its thing. The web server has a recipe, if you will, a set of instructions to how to take the request that comes in from the user and create a results page that's geared just towards this particular user. Now, we don't study server-side scripting in this class. We just study the first part of this. And the first part of this is to allow the user to enter data. And when the user makes a request, that first the platform you're using or so on get sent through the internet to the server and the server can use the form information form and other information to create a page geared just for that particular user. So we don't study server-side scripting in this class so we're not going to do this piece of it. But we are going to do the HTML piece, and that allows the user to enter data. And that's where we'll pick up on next time. Are we okay in North Ridgeville, or do we have any questions? All right. All right, time for lab. <laughs>